Peace Prize awarded. An Indian activist for children and a Pakistani teenager share the Nobel Peace Prize. Up close and personal, Pope Francis chats with lay couples in Rome for the Synod on the Family. Renewed protests, pro-democracy demonstrations are expected to rebuild momentum in Hong Kong. And America's best cities, one magazine's take on the top towns in the USA. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, October 10th, 2014. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Supporters of the Nobel Peace Prize are celebrating history tonight. For the first time ever, an Indian and a Pakistani national are jointly sharing that award. Wyatt Goolsby is here now with the details. Brian Malala Yousafzai is the youngest Nobel Prize winner ever at 17 years old. She shares the award with Kailash Satyarthi for their work on protecting children and young people. Children must go to school not be financially exploited. Today, the Nobel Committee praised both winners, citing their struggle against the suppression of young people and children's right to education. Malala is a schoolgirl and education campaigner in Pakistan. She was shot in the head two years ago for insisting both girls and boys have the right to go to school. Appropriately, she got the news of her award while in class in England today. And I was really happy by the response of my teachers and my fellow students. They were all saying that we are proud of you, even though um, it's not going to help me in my tests and exams because it totally depends on my hard work. But uh, still, uh, I'm really happy that they are supporting me. Today, the Vatican congratulated Malala on her award on Twitter. Pope Francis was also considered a contender for the award for his peace efforts in the Middle East. Malala joined 60-year-old Kailash Satyarthi, who has worked in India for decades to end child slavery and exploitative child labor. Satyarthi says he's honored, but he wants to get back to the task of saving children. Today, when everybody is happy in my office, in my organization, in my country, millions of children, children are still trapped into slavery. And this is a challenge for me. And it's at this moment, I'm feeling that until and unless I'm going to free all of them, each one of them, I'm not going to sit quiet. The Nobel Committee chairman also says it's important that the Peace Prize go to both an Indian Hindu and a Pakistani Muslim. They say the award recognizes their common struggle. Brian. All right, thank you, Wyatt. Certainly two people making a big difference in the world. Archbishop Joseph Kutz of Karachi, Pakistan, is in Rome right now for the Synod on the Family. He's joining us on EWTN News Nightly. And Your Excellency, I wonder what your reaction is to Malala winning the Nobel Peace Prize. It was a wonderful surprise. And yet we did hear uh, it, that it was sort of building up to that. But yet the fact that a young girl like this, a teenager, has won the prize, uh, such a prestigious international award, is a source of great pride for us. And for the country as a whole, a great honor, because I think the image that has developed of Pakistan internationally is a country of terrorists. You know, that's where Osama bin Laden was hiding and things like that. And this just shows that there's the other side to a country as well, that there are people like uh, this little girl Malala who stand up to a lot of negative things that are happening. So it's, it's, really, it's really something wonderful that has happened. So there is a peace, a, a part of that country is peace. As we look at the sharing of the Nobel Prize, though, between Malala and a Hindu from India, what kind of statement do you think the Nobel Committee might be trying to make in doing this? Uh, I'm not very clear myself yet because I've just heard the news secondhand about the other person from our neighbor country, India. But I think he's a person who was involved, involved in uh, saving children and working for the betterment of children. And I think the connection there is, here is this side in Pakistan, this, well, a child, which she was very young, <clears throat> who, who stands up so bravely for the education of women, which was being threatened by a certain extremist group called the Taliban. And the other side, our neighbor country, is a senior person, a man who has been also working for, to, to save children. Because in, I think, both our countries, for example, there are things like child labor, there's abuse of children, is quite common, and so many other things. So both of them, in their own way, have been working to protect children and to work for the development of children. 
And certainly peace is universal. Archbishop Joseph Kutz of Karachi, Pakistan, joining us from Rome. Your Excellency, thank you for being with us. Thank you. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Today at the Synod on the Family in Rome, bishops heard almost exclusively from lay people. Pope Francis posed for a few pictures with some of them, chatting with them this afternoon. They work in fields such as bioethics, pastoral care, and human ecology. One woman appeared to give the Pope a letter, which he tucked between some other papers. The outdoor get-together was very brief, lasting only a few minutes before all returned to the work of the Synod. From Rome, where the Synod on the Family is underway, we're joined by Cardinal Vincent Nichols from Westminster, England. Cardinal Nichols, thank you so much for joining us. Can you tell us where we are with the Synod as of today? Well, we have now finished a week of personal interventions with upwards towards 200 different interventions or little speeches made. So we're beginning to get the picture of the experience and the concerns that bishops from around the world bring and those who've been invited to speak to us as well. This afternoon we will listen to the delegates from other Christian communities around the world, from the Greek Copts and from the Church of England as well, the Anglican Communion. And then it's a difficult task for Cardinal Urdu because he has to summarize all of this and give us on Monday morning the key lines of questions and issues that we will then discuss in our small groups for the first three or four days next week. You've heard from sub several married couples on the ups and downs of marriage, even sexual intimacy in marriage. How has that enlightened you personally and other members of the Synod, this testimony of these couples? Well, I think for me this has been a novelty in this Synod. Not simply that we're hearing from married people in this case, but because they're given the first voice. So each session has had a theme, and the theme has been announced, and then the first people to speak are the married people. So they speak to us of their trials, of their struggles, and in fact, many of them have, have touched me very deeply, actually. There was one couple who spoke about the enormously positive effect uh, in their lives of giving up an artificial method of contraception and turning to a natural fertility control, natural methods of birth regulation, and how that introduced into their life great patience with each other, tenderness and gentleness, and those qualities forming the atmosphere in which they bring up their children. And it was a very, very moving contribution. It certainly touched me very deeply. And you said that you will be hearing from representatives of the Anglican Church, you being from England. Just give us a sense of that. Well, it's Bishop Butler who's from the northeast of the country, and I know he has a very good partnership with the local Catholic bishop, uh, Bishop Cunningham. He's a married man. He told me he's going to talk about his own experience of marriage as well as that of a bishop in the Church of England. So I look forward very much to hearing his experience. And of course, we've heard a little bit from some of the Eastern Orthodox churches and their, ex their approach to the dissolution of marriage in the case of adultery. That I think we'll hear about again this afternoon. Very interesting developments. Uh, Cardinal Nichols, thank you so much for joining us from Rome tonight. My pleasure. Good afternoon to you. And the UN says at least 500 civilians trapped in the Syrian town of Kobani are likely to be massacred if Kobani falls to the Islamic State. That grim warning came as ISIS terrorists pushed deeper into the embattled town. The military extremists have been shelling Kobani's single border crossing with Turkey, trying to capture it. The onslaught on Kobani has forced more than 200,000 people to flee across the border into Turkey. Activists say more than 500 people have already died in the fighting there. The Vatican says five men who accompanied a recently freed Franciscan priest are still being held hostage by jihadists. Father Hanna Jalouf was released by rebels and is now under house arrest at the convent in his town. Militants are accusing the captives of collaborating with Syria's Bashar al-Assad's regime. The U.S. military arrives in the West African nation of Liberia to take up the fight against Ebola. 
More than 300 American troops will be building 17 clinics and setting up a 25-bed hospital. Liberia has been hit hardest by the Ebola outbreak. More than 2,200 people have died there, according to the World Health Organization. The total death toll is now over 4,000, with most of the others in Sierra Leone and in Guinea. And as America steps up its defenses against Ebola, and five major U.S. airports begin screening some travelers for Ebola this weekend, an Ebola survivor is talking about life after the disease. There have been good days and there have been bad days, and um, just regaining my uh, stamina and um, just growing stronger. And it's very possible that we might go back. Um, we're just asking the Lord for His direction on that and, and waiting for the, the right time to be able to go back. What courage. Christian missionary Nancy Wrightbull was one of the first two Americans medevaced to the U.S. after contracting Ebola in West Africa. Thousands of protesters turned out in Hong Kong today, reviving a pro-democracy movement a day after the government canceled talks with student leaders. Jason Calvi is here now with that story. You know, Brian, that uh, breakdown in talks seems to have energized the protest movement. Pro-democracy leaders have called for more people to flood the streets, and that's exactly what happened today. Students take to the streets once again in Hong Kong. It's been almost two weeks. If it not speak out today, we may not be able to do so in a few years' time. Political science professor Joseph Chang is one of the leaders of the pro-democracy movement. He says he finds strength in his Catholic faith. Christians in Hong Kong, of course, are acutely aware that Christianity has been very much suppressed by the Communist Party of China. When Britain handed over Hong Kong to China, Chinese leaders agreed to a one country, two systems model. But now Hong Kong residents want a greater say in choosing the city's leader and more. I think most of the people, they want order and stability. Uh, however, the reason why people take the issue to the street is exactly because the legislature, the representative body, is not really functioning. New Jersey Representative Chris Smith is the co-chair of the Bipartisan Congressional Executive Commission on China. Its annual report, which came out yesterday, slams China's interference in Hong Kong's future election. The people of Hong Kong deserve better, uh, and they're on a glide slope now towards looking just like Beijing, which means no religious freedom, no other fundamental rights, including the one child per couple policy, which is not implemented in Hong Kong, but Beijing would love to impose it there. But China's foreign ministry says this U.S. report twisted the facts and hurts China-U.S. relations. The government also calls the protest movement illegal. And, Brian, they say it also hurts the social order. Very important story. You covered it well. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Brian. Coming up, with divorce front and center at the Synod on the Family, an expert looks at what causes so many failed marriages. Today's Twitter feed from Pope Francis's official Twitter page reads, Dear young people, Christ is counting on you to be his friends and witness to his infinite love. On Friday, October 10th, thanks for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Two Italian cardinals say the church should increase its support for divorced and remarried Catholics and in some cases allow them to receive communion. Cardinal Francesco Coca Palmario says something needs to be done for divorced and remarried people, especially those with children. Cardinal Dionigi Tedamanzi told Italian media that he is open to communion for divorced and remarried under certain conditions. Cardinal Tedamanzi is retired, so he is not taking part in the Senate. Dr. Hillary Towers is a developmental psychologist who, whose work focuses on marriage and parenting. It's good to have you with us. I wonder what key facts do we know about divorced families? Well, I would point first to some new data um, that have just come out recently, which call into question sort of the narrative that's been coming out of social science research for many years, which is that divorce rates peaked in the late 80s and stabilized and then began to decline, especially among more highly educated Americans. Um, what these data show is that um, this pattern doesn't apply to 
couples in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, basically the baby boomers. They're the ones who were divorced in great numbers in the 80s, and now they're on their second and third marriages and are, are divorcing again. Um, now, young people, millennials, are seeing a, a stabilizing of their divorce rates, but it's not because their marriages are doing well, it's because they're um, tending to cohabit. And, and to avoid marriage. Or waiting for a long time to get yes, married. Yes, exactly. Know. But we know in general about average differences in outcomes between family members who experience divorce and those who don't. We know that in general divorce causes harm uh, to adults and children across a wide array of outcomes. We know that adult children of divorce are much more likely to get divorced themselves, especially when the parents remarry. And finally, we know that in the vast majority of cases, <clears throat> excuse me, divorce um, happens in marriages that are not characterized by significant conflict. So mm. these are marriages that are they're doing okay. They seem to be at least doing yes. okay. Now you've worked with troubled <coughs> marriages in a local parish. What insight did you gain from that with this direct contact with people going through this? Well, um, you know, I had internalized a message from the culture. I think it's very representative of other people's opinions about why divorce happens. I thought divorce happens to people who have, you know, marriages full of conflict, and then divorce happens to people who just sort of grow apart and they decide mutually to move on. But what I began to see around me, which was the impetus for this group that I started, is a third um, type of divorce, which is uh, situations of um, Catholic men and women who've been married a long time, have a number of children, they practice their faith together, they have fun together, um, but the man or the woman essentially has an affair and um, encountering no resistance at any level of society, he or she files for divorce, um, abandons the marriage, and then moves on with the affair partner, either into cohabitation or remarriage. Can a marriage survive an affair? Oh, definitely, yeah. definitely. But it, I, you need support <clears throat> yes. from the family for the marriage. Oh, yes, the support is critical. No one can obviously do that sort of thing alone. So you need good, solid counseling, but yeah, you need the support for the marriage bond, especially at the level of the family mm -hmm. of origin. Can I ask you very briefly, what do you hope church leaders address regarding divorce at the Synod on the Family? You know, I saw yesterday that Cardinal Pell of Australia, uh, who, who's there attending the Synod now, had said, um, our society desperately needs what Catholics have to offer. And I think he put his finger on it right there. Young people, especially in this country, need to see a new model of marital uh, commitment. And so my hope for the Synod is that they, they come out with a strong, unqualified expression of support for the marriage bond. And I would just say, finally, that if, if your viewers are interested in knowing about some more concrete steps that we all might take toward that end, there's a letter that's been written to the Synod, which is at marriagecommitment.com. Marriagecommitment.com. I have read that. <laughs> a developmental psychologist, Dr. Hillary Towers, thank you so much for what you've been able to contribute tonight. Thanks for having me. Up next, do people have the right to die when they choose? A Catholic response to tragic situations in life. And you may be living in one, or not. A magazine lists what it finds to be America's best cities. On Friday, October 10th, thanks for watching EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. A 29-year-old Oregon woman is scheduled to end her life on November 1st. Brittany Maynard was diagnosed with brain cancer in the spring. She says she wishes there was a cure for the disease, but she says she doesn't want to endure more pain and suffering. Maynard and her new husband moved to Oregon because of the state's death with dignity laws. It is the first state to make it legal for doctors to prescribe life-ending drugs to terminally ill patients. Maynard is planning to take the pills a few days after her husband's birthday. To talk more about this, Jeannie Monahan, president of the March for Life Fund. Also joining us by Skype from Chicago, Erica Latham, director of clinical ethics for a Catholic health care system in Illinois. Jeannie, let's start with this idea of the right to die. Do we have a right to choose when we die? Well, you know, it's like abortion. I mean, by a right, are we talking about is it legal? Well, sure, in certain states it's legal. Does that make it the ethical, the best thing to do? 
Absolutely not. In this scenario, and in any scenario like this, it's um, something like this is trying to take control of life in a way that we're not meant to do. And this woman is definitely suffering. She's really in pain. Erica, I, you meet with people in end-of-life situations. How do you help them to work through this really difficult moral dilemma? I think we have to affirm that we would support death with dignity. There's no question about that. We support somebody's ability to die with as little suffering and as little pain as possible, to die comfortably and in a place where they wish to die, surrounded by their loved ones. Um, but we have to distinguish that from intentionally killing somebody. Um, intentionally killing is not the same thing as death with dignity. Um, so we'd start by, by talking with the patient about their concerns, about their expectations, about what their goals of care are, about what's most important to them. And then from there, we'd go on to figure out how we can use medicine to allow them to achieve those goals. Jeannie, if you had a chance to talk to Brittany, what would you say to her? I think I'd, I'd first, like Erica was just saying, I'd first just affirm that she's in a really difficult scenario in her life and just, um, you know, try to talk about that. But then I think to also talk about some scenarios that I've known where people whose life has ended prematurely have died with tremendous surrender to God's plan and especially that it, our life doesn't end with death on this earth. It's really in the face of death that we begin to understand the full meaning of life. And I think I'd talk with her a little bit about that. Erica, what would you say to this young lady? Well, every circumstance is different. I think I'd like to start by listening to her, hearing more of her story. Most of what we know about her comes through the news stories. Um, and then I'd like to talk with her about the, the recommendations that the physicians have given her so far and to consider other options as well. I, I, my understanding is that she's concerned about becoming resistant morphine. Um, in, in our experience, morphine is not the only tool that's available in a palliative care physician's toolbox. So we'd look at other options from there. All right. So Erica Latham joining us from Chicago by Skype. Jeannie Monahan from here in uh, Washington, the president of March for Life Fund. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. You're welcome. And truly death with dignity, a beautiful send-off today for Father Benedict Groeschel at Newark's Cathedral Basilica of the Sacred Heart. His massive Christian burial comes just a week after the Beatification Mass for Blessed Miriam Teresa Demjanovic in that same beautiful cathedral. Father Groeschel was a frequent guest and host on EWTN from its earliest years, working very closely with our foundress, Mother Angelica. He helped found the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal. Father Groeschel died last weekend at age 81, leaving a legacy of books he authored and programs he recorded for EWTN. A new list of America's favorite and perhaps some of its not so favorite cities has been compiled by Travel and Leisure magazine. Catherine Elliott checks it out. This year, Providence, Rhode Island got the number one spot in the best cities overall. And rounding out the list, Houston, Kansas City, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Los Angeles. Travel and Leisure also broke the cities down by several other categories, including culture, shopping, food, and quality of life. Looking for the city where your dollar goes the farthest, as well as being one of the top cities of the year, Kansas City also made the list of the most affordable cities, along with Oklahoma City, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Houston. Looking to make friends? The top five friendliest cities include Nashville, Salt Lake City, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Kansas City, and Oklahoma City. On the other end of the scale, the lists for the rudest and for snobbiest cities both included New York, Los Angeles, Boston, and Miami. This is the eighth year Travel and Leisure has asked its readers to rate their cities. Participants were given their choice of more than 1,000 destinations in more than 60 categories and asked to rate them on a scale of 1 to 5. Survey cities are based on reader feedback and tourism statistics. Catherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you for watching. We leave you tonight with some wonderfully candid images from the Synod on the Family in Rome, which continues next week. Have a good weekend and God bless you.